Hello, Internet. My name is Thais Elbers. I'm a theoretical physicist and a mathematician, and welcome to Nova Machina. So that swines back a little bit. My personal mission is full body exoskeleton technology. An exoskeleton is basically any kind of variable piece of mechanics that helps you move. And the holy grail within exoskeleton technology is full body. Now people have been trying for a decade to achieve full body exoskeleton technology. For that same time people have failed. And that is because they made one critical mistake. Exoskeletons are not robots. Exoskeleton technology is not a field of robotics. Robots are designed to do the things that we are not good at, which means that they are a terrible basis for exoskeleton technology. This is why I create everything myself. The actuators, the sensors, the computer. I create them all myself so I can make the most natural choice for exoskeleton tech. So last time we focused on the sensors. One thing that I found out is that the sensors by themselves are not intelligent enough. If I push and pull on the exosystem enough, the system will get confused. And for that we need to improve the computational side of things. And that is the focus of today's episode. So the goal this time is to make an exosystem with interaction, understanding. It means that the exosystem knows what to do when it is holding a weight or when it is under pressure. So let's compare this to the old system. Before, the signal from my body would be perceived by the sensors and with the help of some basic logic gates, an instruction would be formed and sent to the exosystem so that it could move. In response to the exosystem moving and touching things, force feedback would be sent to me. So if the exosystem would touch something, me on the inside would feel it too. But this was not quite enough. Given complex tasks, Mark 1 could get confused. And so we have come to need more intelligent computation. We're going to do this by tapping into the force feedback tank we already have. We reuse the data in this system to run a more sophisticated algorithm that is then used to correct the movement of the exosystem. We're also going to construct a new test article. Let's call this Mark II. The plan for Mark II is to be a simple, separate arm that will move like me, but from a distance. As we discussed last time, this will be safer when doing experiments or when working with large forces. I'll still wear the sensors and force feedback system on my body. It's only the mechanical parts that are on Mark II. Mark II is built as simple as possible. One of the things I learned from Mark I is that 3D printing is my enemy at least at this stage of development. Any adjustment requires a new print, since prints are too brittle to modify. So I've taken inspiration from World War I airplane techniques for making the airframe. In this technique, you create 3D strength by bending and riveting together lightweight strips of steel. This technique was essential for Mark I, and so I reused it for Mark II. We also need to talk about the pneumatics at some point, but let's first look at the results. Testing starts with free motion. The arm would have to simply follow my motion without carrying a load. I decided to use footage from my actual first test. That felt most honest, and at the same time you can see the improvements over time as I calibrate Mark II between shots. So once the free motion started to work, I got in the way. I stopped Mark II from moving freely every now and then to see if it would get confused. And as you can see, the arm would resist my blocking and go to the intended location after I let it go. Now, the reason this is a hard problem is because the pressure in the piston needs to build up for my blocking to be resisted. But that same pressure needs to be released exactly so that the new position is reached in a controlled manner. I like to think this is a similar problem as with the SpaceX hover slam maneuver. Open the valves too quickly, you won't reach the required arm destination 
open the valves too slowly and the arm overshoots. So what I'm trying to do here is try and trigger a false signal in the sensors. If I move around a lot, the chance exists that that happens, but it didn't, so uh, I just end up looking a bit silly. <laughs> For the next test, I tensioned some elastic bands between the floor and the arm. It did cause Mark II to slow down a bit, because it was tensioned so close to its maximum carrying capacity, but this way we could see if Mark II can handle a variable load. Now Mark II is handling this great. We're starting to approach the capabilities of more, let's say, professional systems. The difference is that we're working within very limited resources. And I think that means that our choice to develop everything from the ground up is starting to pay off. The material cost of Mark II is well under 100 euro. With this kind of price per degree of freedom, we have a serious shot at making full body exoskeleton tech a reality. The last test we did was with a water bottle. This may surprise you, but this is actually really hard for the arm to hold. The sloshing of the fluid gives a signal to the force feedback system that is so complicated it might as well be random. But despite this random input, the arm should still hold the water still, or wherever I want it to go. And the thing is, it kind of works, somewhat. This is where we run into the pistons again, they're quite weak which means we can only test the sloshing effect with small amounts of water, which is not a great challenge. So what we need is stronger actuators. Okay, so let's talk about the bigger plan. Project Gaia so far, which is the logic and initial computation, was designed for a low pressure system, which means I don't exceed, I think, 0.7 or 1.3 bars in our operations. One way to improve the system to handle larger energies and larger forces is to up the pressure to start transforming our infrastructure to, well, a high pressure system of 10 or 20 bar or 100 bar. I, I, I really don't know how far we should take it hypothetically, but the thing is, with that, problems arise quite exponentially we would need a much heavier compressor. We would need much thicker tubing, which is also much stiffer, which will give, come with engineering problems. And we'll need much more heavy duty valves and pistons, which means that whatever we're creating is naturally really rather heavy. And then we also have the energy problem. The energy problem is especially painful in exoskeleton technology and pretty much the reason why it isn't out there. The energy problem is that all the energy we spend with this kind of robotic exoskeleton thing that we wear needs to be powered by batteries that we then also carry with the same suit. You can imagine kind of a runaway effect. If the suit is really heavy, you need a lot of energy to operate it, which means a lot of batteries, which are each also very heavy because they're usually metallic in nature, which means more weight, more energy needed. It's a runaway effect. And then we haven't even talked about the thermodynamics of it all. Especially if we work with a centralized system that converts all the energy that the, the suit carries into pressurized air, it means that the batteries and the compressor will heat up significantly. And since we don't want to cook the pilots, we would then need a cooling system, which again fuels into the energy problem because of the extra weight. Now this has destroyed pretty much every exoskeleton research out there. And the reason I'm not going to take this route of highly compressed air is because I think we can be smarter about this. What if, instead of using our infrastructure created with Project Gaia, which is the valves and the uh, computational side of things, or what if we don't upgrade that material to a high pressure system, but what if we simply use it as fuel inlet? Now what that I mean is that instead of 
letting in small amounts of air with a relatively low energy density. We let in some kind of fuel into the pistons themselves and the pistons convert that into much, much more compressed gas than was initially let in as a fuel. It would also mean that we don't need a tremendously heavy compressor, which means that we don't need thick tubing that needs to handle high pressures. It also means that the valves that we have are relatively okay uh, as it stands. The only problem is that we would have to upgrade the pistons to handle, say, a small amount of air, which is relatively cool, but a fuel, they need to be active systems. They need to be more like human muscles. Another advantage would be the lack of batteries. We, instead of carrying metallic batteries that only give up a small amount of energy with a relatively low energy density, we can just carry some fuel. That is a much easier infrastructure. That is just a small pump, some small tubes, a bit like veins, and then a artificial muscle where the food goes. The waste heat problem is also much more manageable now. Instead of creating all the energy in one location, we do it at each muscle, which means each muscle heats up according to its own energy use, instead of one compressor heating up well with the energy expenditure of the entire suit, which means we're not cooking our pilot. Probably the best example we have that we should take this route is that the human body works this way. We have muscles with a kind of fuel intake, oxygen burning system. Our energy is not produced in a central location, it is produced at muscle. And I, I think the reason why this will be efficient, and frankly more efficient than working with electric engines and batteries, is because there's also a certain efficiency in design. That's why I lean so much towards what the human body is already doing. It is why I aim to build artificial muscles and why we haven't looked a lot at proper pistons because they were always temporary. This is where Project Elita comes into play. Sorry for the code names, I just love them. Project Elita is a set of experiments that I intend to do to achieve artificial muscles, very much like the human body. Lightweight fuel convert converting, very much like the human body and small so that we can use them in parallel. And now that we know that's the communication material, which is Project Gaia, between my body and the exoskeleton seems to work, I feel confident that we can start Project Elita, which is an upgrade of the pistons to more artificial muscles. One of the first things that I've done is uh, I need to do a lot of theoretical work, so I've rented an office in Amsterdam. That is going to help a lot, and I think if we can at some point afford it, we can upgrade that to a proper laboratorium to do these experiments. Uh, it will probably take like six months before we get there for, to, to, to actually finish up the experiments and start getting a first um, viable muscle. And one of the other things that I've been thinking about is how to fund this project. Because the current state of the research is, is that I'm pretty much broke. And that is quite a big problem, actually. Because one easy way to fix that is to get investors on board. I've talked to quite a few of them, and they all seem really happy to get on board with such a technological pursuit that already has some results. And the problem with getting investors on board is that they want their money back at some point, and they want to make a profit. And the easiest way to make money of exoskeleton tech that actually works, which is my intention, is to sell them as weapons. And I don't see, uh, yeah, it's very simple, I don't want that. The mission I set out to achieve is to well, achieve full-body exoskeleton tech, but also for the betterment of humanity, to help, to help people to be more productive, to save lives. Um, so then investors don't seem the way to go. And then I've also considered crowdfunding or patronage. But the problem with patronage is, but the problem with that is that the research may one day be successful. And if the research is successful, we get to this awkward position that's that would result in a company, in an endeavor that might be profitable. And then I've made a profitable company out of someone else's goodwill donations, which seems unfair. Now, I make these videos for a fairly particular reason, not just because I think it's funny, but also because I think that this technology comes with a certain responsibility. A responsibility to introduce it. Like If it all works out, I feel a responsibility to introduce it into the world in a safe way. And the best way to guarantee that I'll be doing that for years without the corruptions of Vuvuzi or without the seduction of Vuvuzi money is to be completely transparent about what I do. And that might be where we find 
a happy medium, let's say. I cannot get investors on board because of the pre because I would be pressured to make weapons. I cannot receive donations because of, because it is unfair. But, but maybe we can do something in between. W what if, for as long as this project is a research, I accept donations. I accept a patronage. Then, when hopefully one day this will result in a company that's somewhat prof profitable, I say, hey, this has been built on donations. I now convert those donations into investments or in a loan basically i'll say i'll give you your money back and i'll give it back with interest now by considering on the long-term investment donations to be investments we kind of capture the best of both worlds but then there is one really obvious problem like it's it's a contract less promise there is no contract that binds us and then i thought wait but we already have a way to keep a promise, which is to develop this technology in a safe way. We already have a way to, to keep me on the right track, which is be transparent about what I do. Kind of be out there. And then I, I thought, isn't the same true for this contract? Could, couldn't we agree that, or could, can I not make a formal promise that whatever donations I receive or considered a investments if Nova Machina ever becomes a profitable company. I think that's really strong. I think there might be something there, but to be frank, I really uh, really need your feedback on that. Like, well, do you think that's wise or do you think it's fair? I have given it a code name though, so don't worry about that. Anyways, um, I think that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you next time and uh, cheers guys.